Andrew Bailey is Head of Talent at the Coventry Building Society. In our conversation today, he talks to us about the CARES values model that has been built and evolved over the 136 years that Coventry Building Society have been going. He gives us insight into what the well-being passports are and how they are used within the organisation to drive deeper conversations between employees and their managers. And he also talks candidly about the significant life event that opened his eyes up to the fact that friends and family come first. Enjoy the episode. Andrew, fantastic to, to have you here today. Thank Welcome to me. the Happy Workplace Project. I'm really looking forward to our conversation today, having known you for a number of years and been able to, to watch and at times be involved in the progression that Coventry Building Society has, uh, has gone through. So I wondered if you could start by giving us some insight into your career and how you came to where you are today. Yeah, sure. So I'm not going to bore you with everything. I'm not going to take you through everything. I kind of landed in HR a little bit by, by accident. My word, I've loved it ever since. You know, I've been working in HR now for, for near enough sort of 15, getting on sort of later on 15, 20 years. Thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. I've gone through, I suppose, some had some real sort of highlights, ended up in FS working for Alliance and Leicester. Uh, that progressed through then into the financial crisis in 2008, where I had some amazing opportunities with Santander. And now I'm working with the Coventry Building Society. So uh, I'm currently head of talent at the, the Coventry Building Society. Worked in a, a number of different roles at the Coventry, but absolutely loving the one I'm in at the moment. This is all about bringing in really, really talented people and, and, and enabling them to be their very best at the Coventry. Given that this podcast is all about culture, I wondered if you could describe the culture of Coventry Building Society for our listeners. Yeah, I really struggle with that question. <laughs> really, really sure. Everyone always talks about culture. I think it's really hard to, to truly give a definition of a culture. What does it mean to you then? What does it mean question? to me? Yeah, so what does it mean to me? What, when I look at the Coventry, I kind of look at some of the data points and I look at the stories that people tell in terms of their experiences and there are lots of different subcultures within the Coventry but overall actually we've got you know market leading levels of, of customer service our NPS scores are always in the 70s we do amazing things within the community last year over three and a half million was was put in the community projects when I look at the success of the business as well, you know, we had an absolute stellar year last year helping our members. So, you know, those those sort of things come together. But when when I look at it in terms of some of the, the key decision making, when I talk to the execs in terms of, you know, key things that we want to do, they always want to do the right thing. And I suppose bringing that back to, you know, last, you know, people have been really struggling in terms of the cost of living crisis. And, and that's affecting not just our members, but also that's affecting our employees. We put forward a proposal in terms of actually how can we support our people and through this very, very quickly, you know, the leadership team were right on board. And that for me really demonstrates from a cultural perspective, actually, they kind of get it, you know, in terms of doing the right thing. And, and how we can su support our people and our members. So Andrew, could you talk us through the values of Coventry Building Society, but also how they were conceived as well? So we have our CARES values. And the CARES values actually the Coventry have been alive for, for many a year, you know, before I joined the organisation. And, and actually when you talk to anyone, you know, when I remember actually when I went for the job at the Coventry, you know, that was the first thing they talked about. It really, really came through. And that was really refreshing, you know, to kind of go into an organisation who actually, the first thing they were concerned about was actually the values and how you understood the values, but also connected with them. What's quite interesting, actually, about two or three years ago, it was around the time of the pandemic, we were looking at our CARES values and some of the words within there, and they didn't quite relate to where we were as a business. So there's things like, you know, the aspiring we brought in, because actually that was something that we really wanted to bring out, pe and our people, our managers, and empowering as well was another word that we felt was more resonant in terms of actually what we're trying to uh, achieve as a business. And yeah, in terms of those values, they, they're embed embedded in just about everything we do. And that, that was going to be my next question. So I know that the business talks about um, using the values to drive the right behaviours within the organisation. Could you give us some insight into how they're intertwined into some of the processes yeah. from a people perspective? It is fully embedded in the DNA of the business. And, you know, be that when you first come in to for an interview or just to meet us, you know, that is the first thing we're always hone in on in terms of actually making sure that people understand our values, talk about them, but also do those do these candidate, potential candidates understand it and, and realise that's kind of our expectations in terms of what we want. Then it flows through. So when you join the Coventry, everyone always has an induction where they meet the CEO, Steve Hughes. He meets every single new joiner and he'll talk to he talk to everyone about the values. He'll talk to everyone about the culture. He'll really, really bring it to life 
Execs will also do the same in terms of that. And then it flows through in terms of everything in terms of that DNA. So be that from reward mechanisms, be that through, we've just refreshed our performance framework, Aspire. You know, it's all about making sure that those values are through throughout the whole of the business and everything we do. Is there a mechanism that's in place to help people self-select out if they come into the business and they find that they're not gelling, shall we say, with uh, the environment and the and the values? Yeah, I mean, I guess you sort of what you're saying is uh, don't don't people sort of you know follow on with the values that you expect? Yeah, we're really 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 tight on that in terms of actually making sure that it's really clear before people join, this is our expectation. Because I think that's one thing that a lot of organizations will get wrong sometimes, where mm. they sort of portray, this is what we are. But then in reality, people don't really experience that. So for us, it's making sure that whole experience is really, really upfront with people. And then we will, we will challenge people on it. You know, as a financial services organization, it's really important that we do the right thing, that we do live by our values, that we do have that integrity. So, you know, leaders will be expected to, to follow those values, but also they'll be expected to, to challenge anyone in their team if they don't understand it, to make sure that, you know, we can support people in that place. Could you talk to us about collaboration within the business? I know that you have a success share scheme and that's really designed to help collaboration across yeah. the organization. And um, bring that to life for us if you can. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's still fairly unique, actually, in a lot of organisations. So we we have the success share, and ultimately the success share is a it's a bonus really that's paid out, but it's a consistent bonus. So you know people, everyone will get the same percentage regardless of whether you are an executive or you know if you're working on the you know on the phones, regardless of where you are in in the business, everyone always gets that. That is really, really unique, I think, for the for a financial services because actually, when you look at it and you, t you talk about performance, it's all about how can a team come together. We try and remove this element of kind of actually competing with each other, which can sometimes happen unintentionally, I think, through certain reward schemes. And from a perspective of individualization, the business is really keen to have bespoke L&D and talent programs in place. Yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah, I mean... I mean, this for me is my real passion at the moment, you know, and, and there's so much opportunity. We, we've, we've kind of looked at certain things in terms of actually, first and foremost, it's around the learning culture. That for us is so, so important. And when you look at the different ways of working that you have nowadays, it's like, how can you get the flow of learning into work? It's, rather than sort of sending someone off to a classroom for three, four days and what have you, you know, how can you get those bite-sized learning chunks? And when, when you look at, you know, people in the workplace now, they don't want to spend hours kind of sat down going through learning materials. They want to have those little bite-sized moments where they can actually you know, upskill, understand what they're doing. So for us, there's a big piece that we're doing around that sort of in terms of actually the learning culture. And, and you know, how do you market that? How do you communicate it? How do you give people time? So, so one thing that I'm really, really proud of is about a year ago, we looked at the way that we identified talent within the business. And that for us is really, really key. I mean, over 45% of our movements are internal movements. So we're always trying to sort of figure out actually what aspirations do people have? You know, what potential do they have? And give them those opportunities. We introduced a new performance framework about a year, year and a half ago, the Aspire framework. And there's a big part of that Aspire framework is we have reflection conversations. So managers will talk to people in their team and say, look, you know, how's it going? All that sort of stuff. But also they talk about what are your aspirations? What do you want to do in the future and through that we can through our sort of systems as well we can then identify people that might want to make a step forward might want to progress and what have you and that was really revolutionary because before it was all about going to a manager and saying that who's good in your team who do you like yeah and that that was like riddled with all kinds of biases and you know we were probably getting the same names over and over again and actually we were really missing out on some amazing talent so we flipped it and actually we've got a massive pool of, of talented people now and understanding more about what their aspirations are and putting them through processes which kind of identify actually how far can they go and how can we support them. So I'm really, really proud of what we've done there in that space. And, and you know, over the course of hopefully the next couple of years, we'll see that sort of really, really benefit the, real, the, the benefits of that. I know that you've been recognised as an inclusive employer as well. 
Um, is some of that relating to what you've just spoken about or are there other things that you're doing as an organisation that have resulted in that? Yeah, um, I mean, massively. I mean, there are certain things from an L&D perspective. That, you know, we've put in place ethnicity talent programme, for example, which is really, really important because actually people from a black, Asian, minority, ethnic will have slightly different challenges or very different challenges at times to, you know, white colleagues. So actually we've looked at how we can tailor some of our learning programmes to make sure that we support people through their different sort of stages of the career, make sure that they get the best benefits of that. One thing that we did sign up to a year or so ago was the, the Race at Work Charter. You know, for me, that was a really, really key part of our journey. We've been on a long journey in terms of actually how can we be a more diverse organisation. That's been a challenge not just for the Coventry Building Society, but a lot of organisations, especially in financial services. You know, how can we become the employer that actually people from all communities want to, to join. But there were two key things that the Race of Work Charter that gave to us. One was around targets. We had never formally before actually said, this is our target, yeah? So, so we're saying, and, and we focus on ethnicity and gender. So we want to have 40% of our, our managers and above to be women. Uh, or, or, or identify as women. And we want 25% of our, our managers and above to be from black, Asian, minority, ethnic. So, so that for me was like a really, really key piece. And that has really focused, I suppose, the minds in terms of actually what we're trying to do. And there's loads of things that have come out on the back of it. The, the second piece that I think I was really proud of is that we made a statement. We made a statement about what we're about. That's on our website. That's what we talk about constantly in terms of actually we are an anti-racist organisation or that's what we aspire to be. And that for me was really, really quite a turning point in terms of actually, you know, treat this sort of, I suppose, challenge to a certain extent in a different way and, and sort of actually really face into it. Fantastic. Well-being at work, Passport. When I say those words, what does that mean? <laughs> Uh, the wellbeing passports were introduced, uh, it was a brainchild of someone from my team, where actually there was a barrier where we have a lot of movement, which is great, you know, 45% of people are moving, you know, on a regular basis in terms of internal movement. But that means then your, your manager might be moving every three, four, six months or so, and it might be that you move as well. And um, this wellbeing passport is just to say, this is the conversation I've had. This is the adjustments that we've put in place. This is how I need to be supported. And it makes sure that you don't have to keep on almost like having that conversation with multiple people. But it makes such a difference to, I suppose, people who, who, who need to have that conversation so they don't have yeah. to keep on justifying it. It's brilliant. And also, I guess, what you're removing the perceived barrier of is that awkwardness of the conversation before the trust has been developed for you to eventually have the chat with that person um, yeah. so and, and that was you know we a lot of a big part of my job and, and what we try and do is listen and and I suppose that came through those conversations where you know a number of colleagues were saying I'm having to have these conversations multiple conversations it feels really uncomfortable I feel like I'm having to justify it over and over again the managers as well then were you know constantly phoning up and sort of saying you know how do I how do I deal with this so I thought actually it's a really simple solution really easy so just want to change the course of uh, travel a little bit and talk about the business. I'm really interested to understand the biggest challenges that you guys are facing right now. So I suppose from a people perspective, first and foremost, I suppose the, the big subjects I suppose that we're discussing as a, as a leadership team, one is around strategic workforce planning. You know, for us, that is the piece that we have never really quite nailed. And when I talk about strategic workforce planning, it's kind of anticipating in the next two to three years, kind of what what do we need from a skill set point of view? You know, what do we see is, is declining in terms of the need and then increasing as well? And that for me kind of is key to for, for me to do my role really well and for leaders as well, because then we can put in place actually how can we develop people so we've got readiness? So how can we constantly transform people and, and help them develop and, and sort of change their skill sets over a period of time to make sure that they're relevant themselves, but also for the, for the business as well? That's one big piece hybrid working is massive you know any time I go to any external event everyone's still trying to sort of figure out how does it work but it is for us it's really really important you know a big big part of what we do is collaboration you know we want to have people together collaborate and what have you but equally we want to get that right balance between actually what's really important to the individual as well the way that we've kind of so far we, we've sort of approached it is it's all about teams so teams figure out what's right for them rather than saying right this is it for everyone because everyone's you know every team is different and we give that flexibility it's also thinking about those key moments key moments are really you know so when you think about that 
that journey that you have as, a, as an employee when you're working for an organization, it's like actually, you know, first day when you join the business, you don't really want to be sat at home on your own. You kind of want to be immersed. You want to start building relationships. So you want to start connecting with people. That's so, so, so important. You know, you need to start from day one building that trust and what have you. And then you're going to have those key moments where you need to come in as a team. You need to you can't recreate sometimes virtually what you're trying to do sort of face to face and almost having those sort of informal conversations. And that for me is key in terms of thinking about, you know, what is the outcome that you're trying to look for rather than, you know, all the different, you know, what is the design to a certain extent? Totally. I think the components that are at play are from the employee side of things. They have increased control and autonomy, which is really, really helpful for productivity and well-being. Yeah. But what's lost from an organisational perspective is connection to the business, connection to other individuals, connection to the vision. And that is obviously a problem. So I guess the challenge is how do you make these things work together? One one thing as well that I've really observed in a lot of organisations is not being transparent about what it looks like in terms of hybrid. So you sort of hear about the great uh, resignation, yeah? And, and there was like this massive shift where people were saying, yeah, 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 you can work from home. That's absolutely fine. And then, of course, now, you know, in these lot of organisations, I think, made quite knee-jerk reactions to say, this is, this is our kind of like constant. And of course, now, in reality, that's starting to change. Yeah. But people are bought into, and understandably bought into a role that is, that's, that's kind of what I expect. So I think there is going to be, you know, I think it's inevitable, you're going to get these sort of like peaks where people are, are leaving organisations because the, what they had expected really isn't the reality of what they're experiencing. I think that's bang on. And if I think about some of the anecdotal feedback that we get from candidates that register with us to look for new jobs, mm. a lot of what comes quite high up the list is that the goalposts have changed around flexibility. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's that's going to be a problem for businesses if they, if they don't continue to solve the problem of making hybrid work for everybody, i.e. Yeah. the business and the individual. I suppose the, the only other two pieces, one is around the cost of living crisis. You know, that for me is massive. You know, people are really, really struggling out there. And, you know, that's not just our members, but that's our people. And it's about making sure that we do everything we can to support our people. And, and you know, and that can lead to, you know, I've, I've, unfortunately, I've seen it in the past where, you know, when people do struggle, that can also lead to certain things happening, you know, conduct issues, etc. So what we're really trying to do is try and put as much support in place for leaders, for our people, to make sure that we have continuous conversations and support people throughout that and do what we can to, to help people. Those, again, from a people perspective, is around diversity, diversity of thought, and also making making sure that we're representative of our communities. That is so key for us as an organisation. And it's, you know, it, for me, it's the only way that we can be truly successful as an organisation in terms of actually, if we've got a really diverse group of talented people in the organisation, wonderful things will, will happen as a result of it. You know, and that, that's proven statistically as well by research and what have you. So it's not just me saying that. From, from an organisation, I suppose, from a macro perspective, my word, the the we are facing in financial services for the first probably about 10 years now suddenly consumer behavior has just changed yeah we had 10 years where we had flat interest rates everything was really stable everyone was you know everything was kind of fine so we we will have people in our business who have never really had to deal with you know these constant sort of changes in terms of the uncertainty of the interest rates and now as a business we're really having to face into that you know these consumer behaviors are changing dramatically and how can we support support members but also how do we support our people to make sure that they themselves can sort of manage that and manage all these different sort of fluctuating sort of challenges so with that in mind what do you think the business will look like in five years time yeah i mean so that that's the kind of question that we're always kind of like trying to think about yeah one one key thing that we have in terms of our, our north star is around our purpose our purpose is about giving people the power to be better off through life that is everything everything we do comes back to that uh, and that's sort of you know obviously that's quite a wide statement but it can be applied in different ways we're a really simple business it doesn't feel like it at times but we are you know we're, we're mortgage and savings that that's kind of what we're about we're about giving mortgages out and we've been doing it for 138 years and it's about bringing in people's savings and giving them brilliant rates 
The piece that I suppose we will be looking at over the next five years is probably how do we work within those areas. So if you think about, you know, uh, be it sort of young savers, for example, you know, how can we make sure that actually we develop really, really good saving habits in, in younger people and support them, you know, through through their sort of life journey, etc. When you look at rental, you know, there's some amazing opportunities we could do in terms of from an environmental point of view. You know, we, we are one of the biggest lenders to from a rental perspective. You know, how could we influence and make some changes which can support a much big, bigger, bigger, bigger piece in terms of, you know, the environment, for example, and sustainability. So I think there'll be some really, really exciting pieces there. One thing we've done as an organisation is, is, is creating a, uh, effectively like, like a hub for innovation. We're really keen to think about how do we get some amazing ideas in there, you know, stop thinking about the cost and all these different reasons why you can't do anything and actually say, what can we do? How do we operate? And that's a really, really exciting piece of work that we're getting some, some talented people that have been identified through our talent process to, to kind of get involved in and give their views. Could you talk to us a bit about your leadership style? Yeah, I feel, I mean, I genuinely feel uncomfortable talking about, <laughs> about that, but I suppose in terms of, and I did, I asked a few people from my team for their views on it, you like know. It. Exactly. Informal 360. Well, that's it, yeah, yeah, on the spot, yeah. Tell me about, you know, but no, genuinely having those sort of conversations. For me, I, I really love to collaborate. I love to collaborate. I think it's in terms of any solution that you come up with, especially from a people or HR perspective, you've got to make sure that you collaborate, you involve people in it, you listen to people, you make sure. That for me is really, really key. I I love to create teams that kind of have energy and also they feel that they can achieve anything, you know, so I will try and deliberately kind of enter into conversations of kind of like the impossible, because actually it's amazing sometimes when you have those conversations about the impossible, there are little things that do come from it that you do actually start to then deliver and and sort of will will come into actual play. So I guess, yeah, from that side, I guess the final thing, I I love love coaching people and supporting people throughout their career. You know, it's a genuine privilege. You know, I've got 30 odd people in my team. I love having conversations. I love seeing people move on from time to time I hate you know you you kind of you know I I really think it's a fantastic thing where if people have come they've worked at the Coventry or they've worked in one of my teams and they've grown they've developed they feel that they've actually done some really cool stuff and feel that they've achieved something and then they move on that for me is fantastic I love that and if we were to think about your personal values how would you define what they are and why are they important to you first and foremost it's around integrity Integrity is like key for me and that sort of that integrity and the trust that you build in people, that is like a, it's almost like a non-negotiable. I, I always start with trusting people, but then there is that when the integrity goes, that that can be difficult to, for me to, to sort of, you know, to deal with. Thinking about your career, you've now done a number of big jobs. What's the biggest sacrifice that you've had to make to be able to deliver within those roles? I'm going to, right, I'm going to give, I'm going to, it was like the, one of the key learnings that I had, and this is when I was working at Santander, and, um, and, and it, for me it was a massive key learning in terms of actually what I did at that moment in time, and how I learned, I suppose, how I can do things differently. And, and it was actually my, my daughter, when she was being born, uh, and, and I'll never forget it, in, in the hospital, and we were going through a massive change in, in the business, and... I was taking phone calls, you know, whilst my poor wife was was kind of like, you know, going into labour and what have you. And and I was doing that. And, you know, at that moment in time, it didn't feel I didn't realise that it was kind of what what are you doing? You know, and it was it was it was one of my mates that called me out about it. And the reason I did that, a couple of reasons, because A, at the time, I didn't want to let someone down. But I hadn't created the environment to make sure that actually everything was in place. I hadn't empowered people to, to be able to own it, to take over. I hadn't anticipated, because let's face it, I had nine months to plan, yeah, for this moment. So it wasn't like it <laughs> wasn't a came, surprise. It didn't come out of the blue that suddenly <laughs> yeah. my wife was, was in labour. But, but, you know, I was taking phone calls and, you know, I was there for the birth, but I wasn't there. I wasn't present. I wasn't kind of like in the mindset because I was worried about letting other people down. And, and in that moment, actually, that was shocking. And, and I, I've really, really learned from that in terms of actually making sure that you, first and foremost, you know, you've got to put family first. Family and friends have always got to come, come first, you know, re- regardless, in my view. But also make sure that you kind of anticipate 
these sort of things when they do happen? You know, how do you empower people? How do you make sure that you're kind of not needed to a certain extent and you don't have that ego where you feel that you need to be needed as well? So loosely continuing on that theme, I'd like to talk a little bit about well-being and I'm really interested to understand what your relationship is like with your own well-being. For example, are there things that you do to protect and optimise it? Yeah, for me, I think there's di different stages in life. You need different things, you know, from a well-being perspective. I'm, I'm a big firm believer and not always a practiser of it, yeah? So I'll admit that I don't always get it right. It's creating habits. Because yeah. if you've got the habits in place, that's when even when the going gets tough, other things come through, you continue with it. It's about building that habit. And it takes a lot of dedication to build the habit. And a lot of people, you know, I, 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 you, know you might run a marathon. I know you do, uh, you know, Ironman and things like that. It's about creating those kind of like those routines and the habits within that. So I try my best to create habits within the working spectrum. But it's not just about this, the, the physical sort of side of it. For me, you know, the, the piece that we... We still haven't, as a, you know, I suppose as, as, a, as a workplace, kind of done enough to really support people on. It's around the mental health element of it, you know, and you know, how do you give people time to, you know, really look after their their inside in terms of their mind and how they are. For me personally, you know, I, I love a podcast. That for me is just really refreshing. You know, I sit in the car, drive to work or what have you. I listen to a podcast. It just in a way, it kind of just gets my brain going in different ways. I've got a friend and I've tried mindfulness. I've really tried it. I'm rubbish at it, but I do try mindfulness as well. And that for me is so easy for someone to do, you know, go on Spotify. There's, there's, you know, literally five minutes you can just try and do mindfulness. And it's so key to try and put those little habits in, in place to, to support you. What's the most difficult decision you've had to make in your career so far? For me, we'll often sort of make sort of decisions which are quite sort of macro in terms of actually you know major impact on potentially on people and that for me is I, you know i sort of worry i worry a lot about making sure that we get it right and, and you know because it, it can go wrong but for me personally actually the hardest moments is kind of when it's quite personal very close proximity to me so the worst the worst situations that for me has always been around if there's someone in your team that you work with and it just doesn't quite work, you know, that, you know, I'm a firm believer that everyone has talent, everyone has talent, but sometimes, even if you've got talent, it just doesn't quite work, whatever, in terms of the, the organisation you're in, the role that you're in, the connectivity with the team, there's something that doesn't quite work. That, for me, is always the hardest. Earlier in our conversation, we spoke a lot about the learning environment that's been created at CBS. Taking a forward view, what subjects do you think should be taught to children in schools to help prepare them for the world and the workplace? Yeah, we, so the, the Coventry, we, we, have, we have partner schools. So we, we partner with schools in, in the Coventry area and we build really, really strong bonds with them. And, and, and you know, the end aspiration is that we bring them through into our early in careers. So, you know, internships and what have you. When I go to the schools and, you know, you meet people, for me, there's... First and foremost, you need the foundation of STEM. STEM courses, I think, are so, so key, you know, so the, and, and the understanding of technology and being tech savvy, that is a, it's almost like a, a non-negotiable. That has to be part of, of you when you go into the future workforce. Then it kind of gets a bit more softer, you know, so I don't like to sort of say you need to have this qualification, this qualification. Then you start to go to actually the things that we're really looking for in an organisation are people that can collaborate, people that can look at a problem and problem solve and really think about, you know, how they can go about it. People that have resilience and the ability to deal with setbacks and what have you, because my word, you know, the way that the world is changing, you are constantly getting these, these sort of setbacks. So resilience is really, really key. And I guess on, on the back of the resilience, it's the ability to constantly learn. You know, that when I, talk, I talked earlier about learning culture, for me, it's, it's never, you know, yes, OK, you want to build some qualifications. But for me, it's the ability to constantly adapt, to be inquisitive, to, to think about actually how can I constantly upskill and learn. You know, when I look at, in particular, within our, our technology teams, you know, they, they are constantly having to think about what is next, you know? So even while they're delivering on certain technology, they need to be thinking in the next six months, we need to be in place where we understand how we can do and deliver something different. So for me, in terms of school children, it's kind of that ability for them to understand that learning is, is key to, to, to being successful. And back to you, what would you say your ultimate life goal is? And when it's all said and done, how do you want to be remembered? Wow. <laughs> That's a bit deep. Um, I guess from a really, really personal point of view, you know, you, you just want to be the best kind of like son, husband, parent. 
you know that that that's ultimately the, the core to mm. you know a, a lot of what what it's about and a really really good friend to people a good trusted friend and what have you so i suppose there's there's that piece then then it kind of links into the workplace the the bit that gives me the buzz is ultimately seeing people doing really well like you know seeing them develop seeing them progress that's amazing, Andrew. That concludes the questions uh, about you and the business. We're now on to our quick fire round. So number one, what's something that you've achieved that you're proud of? From a personal point of view, I ran the London Marathon about four years ago. I'm not a runner. I was rubbish cross country, but I achieved it and I felt it was just the biggest buzz. What's the one word that you would say best describes you? Dreamer. <laughs> oh, wow. Why is that? I love I, I love the thinking about what we can do. That must get infuriating for people I work with sometimes. But I love thinking about you know what 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 is what is the art of the possible? You know how can we dream about stuff like that? Inspiring. How did you react to your greatest failure? Uh, oh God, probably cried or listened to some really really depressing music. I don't know. No, in terms of failure, for me, it's about surrounding yourself with people that you really know and trust. Yeah, and sometimes in the workplace you kind of have those people. In me in particular. Uh, it's about getting my, my mates and, and getting people I feel really, really safe around to kind of like just talk about it. What's something you regret and would have done differently in hindsight? Do you know what? Honestly, I don't, I have, I've had cringe moments in my life and this could be one of these cringe moments, but I don't regret anything. I genuinely don't regret anything. And I've, I've, I've tried to learn that mindset because actually you can't change the past, yeah? You, you really, really can't change the past. Unless it was something really, really dramatic, you can't change the past. You can only do, you can only learn from and go for the future. So no, I, do you know, I don't regret anything. Really. Love that. What's your biggest area of development? I can get distracted. It goes back to the dream a bit. I love kind of like getting involved in things and what have you. Sometimes when the light's really, really shiny, I do get drawn to it. You know, I, I make sure, you know, I'm always, always challenging my team to make sure that they challenge me so I don't do it all the time. But I know that I do, do get distracted. What do you like most about yourself? I trust people. I really, really trust people right at the start. I will trust people. And I, I, dealing with execs, talking to lots of different people, a lot of people really struggle with trust. I start on a basis that I trust everyone and you go from there. And, and actually, I didn't realise it was actually a strength, but, but yeah, I think it might be. I think so. Tell us about something that you're passionate about. Well, I love, I love playing football and things like that, but I won't go there. I love travelling. And I dragged my family. We went from the north of Vietnam down to the south, uh, which is a really, really long way, actually. It doesn't look much in the map, but actually it's a long way, backpacking and doing that. I love it. I love the experiences of meeting different cultures. And I, I think that's partly why I got into HR is I'm, I'm kind of like, you know, fascinated with people, what makes people tick, but also cultures as well. But for me, yeah, traveling, I'm, I'm never happier than when I'm sort of, yeah, I'm off somewhere. Exciting. What's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Oh, I'm going to sound really cheesy now, but there's, there's a quote that I always, rem always remember. I think it's Aristotle, which sounds really grand. Uh, happiness depends on oneself or, or ourselves. I always kind of look back to, you can blame anyone for anything, but you need to kind of look at yourself. And, and that happens a lot in, in that sort of in terms of, you know, we all do it where we kind of say, why me? What's what have you? But actually, the reality is you got to look at yourself. You can make a change. If you want to make a change, you can make a change. So true. And finally, what's one book or podcast you'd recommend to our subscribers? Um, I, I love the High Performance Podcast. I really do love the High Performance Ditto. Podcast. I, I've, I've really got into those. I'm a little bit obsessed with them at the moment. <laughs> and just listening, I guess for me, it's just listening to people's different journeys and their stories. Everyone's so different. And, you know, and there's no kind of like one set rule for high performance. But I think, you know, Jake, Jake Humphreys, you know, he, he facilitates it so well. I think that's fantastic. Brilliant. Well, listen, that concludes today's conversation. Thank you so much for sharing the insights with us. I've thoroughly enjoyed it and it's, uh, it's been great to hear about your journey. Thanks for inviting me. Cheers. Remember to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching.